If we build more shallow water habitats, will there be negative consequences? Could toxic selenium increase and poison the food web? I do get asked the question is what is selenium? Some people have seen it in, as a vitamin supplement. And it's true that you actually need selenium. Uh, it's essential for life. It's essential for your physiology. However, at a certain point, it, too much of it actually becomes toxic. It's a potent reproductive toxin. Selenium occurs naturally in some West San Joaquin Valley soils. The process of irrigation releases selenium and other salts from those soils directly into the San Luis drain. This drain was connected up with this, the Kesterson National Wildlife Refuge. And what they found in the early 80s is that when this connection occurred, they saw over 60% deformity rate in bird hatchlings. It was a very acute and immediate toxic effect. CalFed plans to create new shallow water habitats where more food will be produced for wildlife. Several years ago we did a study that showed that there, the detritus in the system is not a major source of carbon in the system. The major source of carbon is indeed the phytoplankton, the living plants in the system, the microscopic forms. So we're concentrating a lot of our work now on um, phytoplankton, how they grow, how they get consumed, and how they get transported through the system. This is a really simplified version of the food web we have going on here in these habitats. Phytoplankton are eaten by the clams. There are a couple organisms in the delta that can eat them. There's some diving ducks that can actually munch through the really thick shell, and I believe sturgeon can as well. But the zooplankton provide a really important food source for juvenile stages of a lot of our native fish. The researchers need to understand the food web process to make sure that the new habitats will not have water that's toxic to the very species they're trying to protect. Well, these, these clams are really highly efficient accumulators of selenium. Uh, they scavenge it from um, uh, the dissolve phase but also from, uh, more importantly, from phytoplankton. And we also uh, know that they also can assimilate it from organic components of sediment. And because it's such a good accumulator of selenium, and it's so abundant and available to upper trophic levels, that uh, it's actually a vector for selenium getting from the dissolved source um, into upper trophic levels such as fish and, and diving ducks. So, um, not only does it play a role in the food web, but it also plays a role in contaminant transfer. How does water movement carry food resources like plankton and toxins like selenium between habitats in the delta and bay? This is another mystery. The answer ought to be simple. In rivers, water should flow downstream. In the bay, water should move in and out with the tides. But in this system, with all its water diversions, the answer is far more complex and elusive. The people that were studying selenium transport and transformation needed to know how Mildred Island was connected to the rest of the Delta. And so people like us work with people like that to understand uh, or provide a context for their research. Water transports everything else. So it, unless you know where the water's going, you can't predict anything else in the system. If I'm sitting at, at this Chips Island location and my cooler falls overboard, that cooler will go a mile upstream before it turns around. And then it'll come back, and it'll come back almost as far as it went. What excites me about this is that we can look at really specific details of the system, and we can ask a lot of what-if scenarios in the system. We can say, well, what if we ch change the operation of a gate? What if we put in these barriers? What if we back off the, the pumping operations? What effect does that have on the system as a whole? So before we go and spend millions of dollars out, out in the system flooding an island, we can pretend that we've already flooded the island with my computer programs. Breaching a levee so a river runs free. Removing a dam so salmon can return to their spawning grounds. Movements back to nature seem, on the surface, like good solutions, but maybe not. To restore habitats, interdisciplinary science is critical. It takes the combined knowledge of biology, hydrodynamics, chemistry, geomorphology, physics, and more. Working together, scientists strive to unravel the mysteries of an ecosystem by learning how all the parts work together like a complicated machine.
What you have here in California with a big project like this is really a microcosm of what we need in the world. Interdisciplinary projects of scientists working with social scientists and working with politicians and the people are going to be necessary to keep the life support systems of our entire planet from going down the drain. Uh, we are heading in a direction which is totally unsustainable. If we don't learn to do interdisciplinary science and then take advantage of the results, uh, we're not going to have a very nice future for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.